bought the property for forty. We actually put like forty thousand. Forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, Wait, was that the down payment? No, that was the whole house. Eric, thanks so much for having me. My pleasure. I'm really excited to talk about your journey in real estate because as someone who's in my mid-20s, listening to all my peers, we all want to start investing in real estate. We all want to get into the game, but it feels kind of difficult right now with the rising house prices. Yeah, I know it, the house prices seems to be high, the interest rate seems to be high, and that's because a lot of people in their 20s, that's all they've seen. They've seen these high prices, <laughs> and they've seen extremely low interest rate that was not natural. Now we're getting back into normal interest rates. Interesting. Well, I would love to know where you currently are in your real estate journey because you have had quite the ride. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure where to start. So I do have a, a few investment of my own, a few portfolio. I have an apartment building. I have some uh, single family rentals. I'm all about real estate rentals. I think this is, uh, this is the best way to do it. Of course, I have other companies that, uh, that I work on. I have Martel Turnkey, and I also have a new company that we launched uh, last year called Flip System, where we help real estate investors actually invest like we do. Amazing. And so how long have you been in the real estate game for? Well, really, the first apartment building that I bought was I bought an eight-unit apartment building when I was 18 years old. I was you were still 18? at yeah. Eight, oh my God. Still at university. And um, yeah, so I just like I just happened to f meet someone that was a real estate investor. He was just a, a regular community college teacher, and uh, he had built like a 36-unit apartment building, uh, and he was doing great. He was planning to build a shopping center, a nursing home. So he had a lot of other wow. projects in there. And it's like, how can this person, this community college teacher, be able to do this kind of things. He knows something that I don't know, and he knows something that certainly my parents never taught me because they didn't know about this. So I said, you need to teach me. You need to teach me right away. And uh, so he became my mentor for that. And what, how did you develop that mentor relationship? How did you approach him? Because I feel like a lot of us, we, we see people doing what we want to be doing, but it's hard to approach people or how to start that relationship. So mentorship is great because it's a shortcut for information and knowledge that you don't have, but it's not everything. Mentorship is just that. You just get information. You still have to do the work. Right. And that's sometimes what people forget is that you have to do the work. You have to stay accountable, be disciplined and do what it takes to, to get it there. But it's sure is a great way to have someone telling you all the shortcuts, all the information mm. and keeping you motivated and letting you know that you're on the right track. And this is what something that was uh, very important to me because uh, I, had, I had nobody else to tell me what to do. Uh, and finding an apartment building to buy uh, outside of, uh, I was in Montreal at the time, outside of Montreal, uh, it, was, it was a difficult journey. I had to talk to, you know, I was 18 years old, so I was talking to my real estate agent uh, who was, was older than me, who was more experienced than me in real estate and stuff like that. And I had to, a, f a few times I had to talk to him and say, no, you have to uh, keep looking. It's there. It's there. But I had my mentor actually telling me that, you know, this is, no, you're on the right track. Keep going. Keeping you motivated without, and accountable, yeah. You know, without my mentor, I would have said, oh, yeah, yeah you're right. The, my real estate agent is, is correct. I mean, what I'm looking for doesn't exist. And then I would have given up for sure, for sure. Wow. Yeah. And so how did, how did you approach your mentor to guide you? Uh, yeah, so I, he was introduced and I was so impressed with what he was doing. I was talking to, to him about uh, real estate investing and, uh, and I had, you know, I was uh, up late at night and there was these uh, commercial that was saying, oh, you know, buy real estate, no money down and <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And I was like, and I just asked him, I said, is that real? Like, can I really buy real estate uh, with no money, no money down? Because this is exactly the amount of money I have, <laughs> you know? So I would, I'm very interested. Yeah. So he said, yeah, he said, he said you don't need necessarily money to, wow. um, to buy real estate. So then how did you buy your real estate with no money? So when you don't have money, then you have to combine that with time and effort. So mm. you have to compensate, I should say, between, with time and effort. So mm. 
it took me a long time to I found a lot of uh, of apartment buildings in my search yeah I was in those days too it was uh, on MLS I know I keep thinking there's a computer that you're using but what what did you do I, everything was printed oh man so it was like uh, binders and binders of uh, printouts each each page was a property and I had to kind of analyze each property to figure out what it was. So there was no like filter for everything that's like uh, this and this oh, and blah, blah, blah. Wow, so yeah. took a long time. Took a long time. So when the thing is that when you doing something like that, that is so like brute force, I would call it, then you find some shortcuts. Like, mm -hmm. so this is when I basically created the 1% rule. Uh, you know, I just didn't market it the same way that some people have uh, marketed <laughs> it. but. You, basically, when you're going through these, these kinds of things, you have to create some shortcuts. So I was kind of looking at the gross rent divided by the value of the property. And if it was within that, uh, that range, I'd say, okay, well, I'm, I would put that page aside and say, I'm going to do some further analysis on that. Interesting. So, and then, yeah, I basically kind of like narrowed down. I had these four or five binders of properties and basically narrowed it down to like about eight properties that would actually make sense. Uh, and then I started uh, talking to my broker about, you know, would they be interested in selling the property with understanding that I had no money, but so I needed to have either like seller financing on the entire property right. or at, at least have some seller financing for at least 20% of the property. And then I can go to a bank to get the, the rest, get of, the the rest money, of the money. The so rest how of long money. did it take you in your search to find the right took, property? It took me about a year to find the right property. So and did you start then at 18 and end up buying it later on in 18? Or was this like you started at 17 or something? No, I, I started at 18. So that 18 is basically, maybe it's a little bit less than a year, but um, so Within basically started year. and then, you know, get the financing and everything through. So I had the house bought in the, when I was 18 years old. Wow. Okay. So that's pretty impressive. Having no money, having no experience, being 18 years old and still managing to get it all together within a year. Mm -hmm. Would you say that this was something that was a priority in your life for you at the same time as your studies or was this more important than your studies or like how did you arrange your priorities to get this mm, done I hope my parents are not listening but uh, <laughs> honestly uh, I found that this was real life education and to me that's much more important than uh, university uh, so unfortunately unfortunately <laughs> uh, but this is this is real uh, this is real life I mean you, uh, university is great there's a lot of great things coming out of university and lots of uh, good education and stuff like that but there's nothing like real life education in my yeah. opinion and um, so that's what I was getting like making things happen and um, so that that was fantastic yeah and I mean you also used networking too you know meeting the people that you did have in university like your mentor mm -hmm. In, amazing. Okay, so now walk us through what happened with the financing then. You said you had two options. You could either get the entire thing seller financed or at the very least 20% mm -hmm. and go to the bank to get the rest. So. so out of all these properties, there was only there was only one seller that was interested in doing any kind of seller financing. So I probably analyzed, mm -hmm. like I said, like, you know, five, six hundred properties and I found only one person wow. that was willing to give me some seller financing. And he was not willing to give me the whole thing. He was only willing to give me 20% of that. Uh, so basically I had the down payment covered. So the next, obviously I had to find 80% of the fund at that point. So I went to banks. Uh, banks don't lend money to people. Uh, I don't know where, who they, where they lend money to, but they don't lend money. So I ended up going to a credit, uh, credit union. Mm. And they're the one who uh, ended up um, pay, pay, giving me the mortgage for that, that amount. Wow. And I still remember writing the check. It was like $125 or something like that for the uh, the processing of the mortgage. The processing fee? Yeah. Oh, my. it was only $125? <laughs> and I had like 150 bucks in the bank or something like that. I said, well, this better work out because I'm going to be eating peanut butter for the rest of the month. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> so, oh, wow. Yeah. And so then with this experience, how did it end up unfolding for you, this building? Yeah, so that so that worked out great. I mean, even, uh, so no money down. I mean, I had done the calculation and calculations, and uh, I was still cash flowing like just under $300 a month in that cash flow. So it was an eight unit apartment building, obviously not the best part of town and all that kind of stuff. So I had a lot of uh, people that were in what would we call like section eight. Mm. Um, there's a couple of people that were working and all of that, and a couple of that were retired. But um, all in all, it worked out great. Um, 
what I would change from this is that, uh, unfortunately, my mentor never used property management. So I never saw the value of property management, and I thought I would be able to handle that, even though All by yourself, I am not yeah. very good at fixing anything. Um, <laughs> so yeah, so basically, that was one of the mistakes that, that I made, I see. that I wouldn't do that again. Uh, I, and I would rather, rather have someone manage the property for me, especially there was a little bit of a distance between where you, I lived and where the property How long was the went. commute? About 45 minutes away. Oh, wow. Yeah. How often would you find yourself going there? Uh, every every other week. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. Because I had like, a, well, that's personal, but my, my girlfriend lived in that uh, in that town, so we would kind of like go and visit oh, like okay. every week or every weekend. Or every and you week. could check up on your property still? And oh, yeah. And they would drive by and stuff like that. So now, you said something pretty crazy. You were fully leveraged on this purchase. Yes. And not a lot of people would feel comfortable with that kind of risk or that kind of amount of debt. What made you okay with it and what made you go through with that decision? Or did you even know it was a big deal at the time? Well, to me, it, it was cash flowing. It's all about cash flow. I mean, the rent is paying for the mortgage, is paying for all the expenses, and it's cash left at the end of the, uh, of the month. I mean, I'm not paying for the mortgage. The tenant is paying for the mortgage. Now I have an asset that is appreciating and uh, I'm getting cash flow every month and I have tax advantages on top of that. Wow, I mean, yeah, so as long as the numbers make sense and as long as the money out is less than the money in, well, exactly. then you're good. Yeah, yeah exactly, <laughs> absolutely. Okay, and so you were, you were feeling comfortable with the risk because it was a calculated risk. You yes. knew that you were gonna be okay. Yes. Okay. And also, I was 18 and foolish. Well, it's a good time to make mistakes, right? <laughs> exactly. I can always recover from a mistake. Yeah, of that age, yeah. So. And did did the property appreciate? How did yeah, it go it when you sold? And actually, a few a few years later, uh, I actually moved away from uh, from Montreal, moved to Toronto, and uh, so the, at that point, someone was managing the property, and then someone called me. My realtor actually called me and yeah. said, "Hey, are you interested in selling that?" Uh, your apartment building. That same realtor that sold it yeah, to you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I said, sure, what's the offer? And, uh, you know, I made like, uh, I think like, this was probably like 20, 25, 20%. Uh, that's pretty good. On top of what I had for paid for. For a few years, right? For a few years, yeah. It was wow. only two years, yeah. That's amazing. And so then did you take that money and reinvest it? Or what did you do with that money? So a couple of problems here. So when I looked back at this, when I went, when I looked back at this investment, um, I'm looking at it and I say, well, if I don't have money, it's very, very hard for me to find a property that works, right? So I had to mm. analyze 600 properties in order to find one that worked, and then so if I want to buy the second one, I mean, I need to have, I need time in order to do this, right? And um, you know, my, my parents were so proud of me buying that first apartment building that they said, uh, we're going to cut you off. And uh, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're so proud of you. Now, bye. <laughs> well, they said like, if, hey, you know, if you have uh, enough money to buy an apartment building, then you don't need our help. But you only put in $125. Yeah, but they don't, they don't care about that. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that was, so I needed some money to live and all that kind of stuff. And so I had to start working. Because my, my problem, the problem that I identified is that if I had money, it would have been much easier. I would have been able to look at more building, bought more buildings and stuff like that. So Right. So you wanted to stop trading your time and energy and effort. And instead you thought it might be easier for you to make more money and take less effort to make money. Exactly. To then increase your power to buy more. So yeah, exactly. I see. So I had to take a job <laughs> and then start working. I was working in a, as an associate actuary. And uh, that's basically the, where we, the, I studied the math of financial risk, so actuarial math. And I worked as, a, as an associate actuary uh, for a, a consulting company. So we were working mm. on pension and all that kind of stuff. And uh, so, yeah, I started working there. But every time in the back of my mind, I said, well, I need to invest in real estate. Unfortunately, I always, so I was in Montreal, Montreal, you can't really, uh, you know, the number, the big cities, the numbers typically don't make sense right. uh, for a small investor. They only make sense for large investors right. that have like lots of money to yeah. throw at and they don't care. Um, so I, then I moved to Toronto. Toronto was the same situation. I tried to buy properties there, rental properties. I tried to uh, do a bunch of stuff and uh, yeah, the, the numbers never penciled out. Hmm. Um, 
then eventually I moved to to San Francisco Bay Area and uh, you know I had I had a lot of money at that time because I had, was working for an IPO for a, a high-tech company and I had tons of stock options I literally had like millions of dollars in stock options oh wow and I said okay now is the time I, I yeah, yeah I have enough money now yeah. right? I, I can't it's not an excuse now yeah so I started looking and then the numbers didn't make sense like I would look and say, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy this uh, apartment building. It's $10 million. I have to put 20% down. Oh, my I said, God. I can do that. So even though you had the money, now you were in a more expensive market, and so it still didn't make sense? Yeah, but then you look at uh, it didn't win cash flow. Yeah. Right? So then it would be even with putting the 20% down, getting the mortgage, all that kind of stuff, then it would, it would be negative cash flow when you include like all the expenses, the property taxes, yeah. all that kind of stuff, and the mortgage. So... I, you know, I don't want. I don't want to do that. I said, "Am I nuts here?" Like I talked to a realtor, and I, I had the realtor actually uh, introduce me to uh, an investor, a real estate investor, and he said, "Yeah, the numbers don't make sense here." <laughs> so, wow. So, uh, so he was investing out of San Francisco Bay Area, a little bit further, mm. like in um, Fresno area, and uh, so the numbers were barely making sense there. But really, the only way that I wouldn't be able to have these property uh, properties cash flow in the San Francisco Bay Area would be to throw more money at it, you know, fifty percent right. right. down payment. Not or so much high leverage and more owning exactly. it in cash. Exactly. Exactly. Okay. But then you end up in the other problem that I have, which is then you're cash poor, right? Re- well, return. Yeah, cash poor, but also return. Your return on equity is mm-hmm. very low. I see. So you end up with a return on equity of one, two percent. Then I'm saying, well, I can might as well just stay in the stock market where I can make seven, eight, nine percent mm. easy on the stock market rather than uh, you know risking it on the on real estate. I see. Okay, so for you, it sounds like throughout your whole kind of like early journey in real estate, you've been very passionate and focused on cash flowing rentals, yes. cash flowing and return on return on equity or return, return on, on equity. return on the investment. Yeah. And I know a lot of investors also see appreciation as something to focus on, and some for some people that's all they focus on. What's your standpoint on appreciation in this whole scenario? Appreciation is is great to me. It's uh, depending on the level that you're at. I think at the beginning, cash flowing and good return mm-hmm. on investment is more important than appreciation. Obviously, appreciation is important, but it's very it's much more long term. Right, you can't you can't access it. Exactly. I see. When you are like, when you own, when you have like millions and millions and millions of dollars, uh, then appreciation becomes a little bit more important because that's a great way for you to increase your um, uh, your equity without uh, without paying taxes. Right? So, I see. So it kind of depends what stage in the game yeah, you're at. Exactly. So in the beginning stages, you want access to that cash to be able to reinvest it. Yeah. Whereas if you are later in the game, you actually don't want to take any money out. <laughs> yeah, I mean, exactly. I see. Yeah. I see. That makes a lot more sense to me. I mean, so you now, can, yeah, you can still take money out, but then the asset itself, and then you can mm. you, you can play other things with depreciation as well, that right? Could offset your income, so you would have cash flow, but no income tax. I see. I see. Okay, so that's when you know you can you can start being more creative, exactly. and you have the space to be more creative. But at the beginning, you kind of just want to nail it, get some cash in the door, or ca- get some cash in your pocket, and and keep yeah. recycling. Yeah, and you don't have to have that much uh, cash flow necessarily, unless you need it for your retirement or for mm-hmm. passive income to quit your day job. Um, but if, as long as it, the property is pays for itself, pays for all the expenses, pays for the mortgage, and it's cash flow at the end then I think you're, you're good. So would you say even a break-even point where if it's just covering the expenses and it's allowing you to purchase an asset, is that good? Well, I think it's good if you're not planning to get, uh, to, to generate use passive it. income yeah. to use it f- okay. to replace your current income. I see. And be financially free. That makes sense. Now, as it relates to like people my age in their mid-20s who really want to get into the real estate game, maybe they just got their first job or they're out of school, what would you recommend and what kind of advice would you give to somebody who's really early on in their career, hardly any money, um, and also no experience? Mm-hmm. So I think the first thing that happened when you're young and um, is that you're kind of thinking about buying a house or something like that when you're at that stage, when you're thinking about buying a home, don't buy a home. Mm. So take that money that you would save in a down payment 
mm -hmm. and investing invest it in a cash flowing rental property. To me, okay. that's that's a big, big, big thing. And, and why? Yeah, that's well, very counterintuitive. Yeah, because you you would be allowed then to to buy assets that are appreciating, that are cash flowing. So it's giving you more cash at the end of the month, and then you have mm. um, you also have tax advantages with that. You, you don't have tax advantages with your primary residence, or some of them are, are pretty limited, right? The amount of, I mean, if I make repairs on my house that I live in, I can't deduct that, but I can totally deduct that in a, in a rental property. I see. And right? so insurance, my insurance premium, I cannot deduct that from my primary residence, mm. but I can from a, uh, a rental property. And, and interest too, right? Yeah, in interest as well. Interest, you can also do it on the primary residence, but uh, often it's capped. So I think like in the oh. last uh, like five years, I think they've capped it in uh, for uh, up to like $10,000 or something like that. I see. Okay, so there's a lot more advantages as well as it's gonna help you financially. And so would you recommend for a young person to just rent in the meantime or yeah. have roommates or to, yeah, what would you recommend? I'm renting. Uh, <laughs> so uh, I think this is great. In fact, the bigger the, bigger the houses that you get, I think the, the the more interesting and the more I call that like subsidized living because it the, the the apartment that I'm living in right now it would cost me three times the amount of money to every month to live in that same space so if you bought it if I bought it wow so, so the, the the more I guess the, yeah the more luxury the more apartments the absolutely. luxury houses it's cheaper to rent it that's right and I, according to my calculations uh, <laughs> So I've done some studies on that, and I think that as if you're thinking if the property that you're going to live in is going to be less, is going to be above four hundred thousand dollars, you should really consider renting instead of buying. Four hundred—that's a really low threshold in I today's know. market. I know that's what that's what I thought. I thought it was very wow. low. But according to uh, the, 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 my spreadsheet, my calculations—that's <laughs> what. According to your calculations. Uh, so if you're, wow. but you're kind of like fifty-fifty at that point. So by that same token, does that mean? That four hundred thousand should kind of be the cap for what you want to look for in a rental property to rent out to somebody else. Well, so you're gonna find that w when you want to have cash flowing rental property, uh -huh. I mean, the the number is around two hundred, maybe two hundred. Two hundred. Yeah. That's pretty low. That's pretty low. So this is why you want to find a market. So that's why you can't buy cash flowing rental properties in California. You can't buy it in uh, cities and stuff. like you that. You can't get that in Texas still. That's right. You can't get that in Georgia. That's right. yeah. You can't get that in Florida. You well, have maybe to go in some places. In Florida, you would have, yeah, you would have to kind of like go wow. into like kind of some nook and crannies of the state uh, yeah. to find something that would work. Now, do you recommend going for cities? that have suburbs with those price ranges or finding a city itself with that price range? I think it's, yeah, definitely a city. So even like uh, some of the cities we invest in, like Cleveland, for example, well, I, we can't buy anything in Cleveland itself. itself so we're right? looking slightly outside of these uh, these cities. Okay. So it's good to have a cities like that of a, of a decent size because there's a lot of infrastructure, there's a lot of jobs, mm -hmm. there's a lot of things uh, going on there. and. Uh, but then people just live like 20 minutes from downtown and you can find totally affordable Good suburb, housing. yeah. Absolutely. Okay, so you're looking for stronger cities, but looking more in the suburbs of the cities. Yes. Interesting. And now with that lower price range for a, house, for a single family house, not just like an apartment building, mm. like an actual house, um, are you worried at all about like the crime in those areas or the different types of people that you get, the types of tenants you would get? Does that change at all? Well, so it does change a little bit. Obviously, if you have like, uh, if you're trying to invest in a neighborhood where the house prices is a million dollars or two million dollars, yeah. you're gonna get a, some group of people. You know, they're gonna be like VPs and stuff mm -hmm, like that in a mm -hmm. company, um, depending on the market. Of course, if you're in California, it's gonna be, you know, uh, it's gonna be a little bit more like software engineer kind of thing. But um, but if you go for these kinds of high prices, you're going to get definitely a class luxury kind of uh, accommodation. Um, and these don't cash flow. They don't cash flow in any market. Right, right. And, the, uh, and they're also the first one to be affected when the economy uh, goes oh. down. So for the $200,000 house in, in markets in Ohio and stuff like that, or $150,000 house, you're going to get... Um, you know, working class uh, managers, uh, people that have like blue collar workers and all that kind of, the nurses, the, uh, the mm. cops, the, uh, you know, all these people, working class people, 
and uh, so good people. Not any less reliable. Not than, any less yeah. reliable. Yeah. Then. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, there are some some people can so if you look at the seat last, uh, this is kind of like BNC class. This is kind of where you you would want to look for. Okay, so now we've established kind of what cities and what markets you'd want to be looking in the price range. Now, a lot of houses that are in that price range are also older. Yeah. That can also become a very big expense or a big issue down the road. Do you have a cap in terms of how old a house should be? Well, so I I don't well I don't want to have like a house that uh, I have to deal with uh, historical situations. It's, so, oh, okay. Right. I don't want to have like uh, <laughs> facade issues and having to go through you know historical city, society yeah. you know to to be able to do any kind of renovations. So I don't want that. I'm not too focused on the year it was built. I'm more focused on um, kind of when like how, how good a shape it is, how much renovations I would have to put in that particular property. Uh, is it a good neighborhood? Um, what's the percentage of uh, owner-occupied houses in that area? What's the crime rate, the schools, okay. all that kind of stuff? To me, that's much more important. more important. There are some very good neighborhoods that have like older homes, and that's where we invest in. Yeah. Um, so the newer home, newer homes don't make sense either. By the way, so if you have a new home or building a home, it doesn't make sense to build a home and rent it out. So when a young person is looking for their first investment and they need to find a place or find a building that meets all of these criteria. Let's say it's not near them, but let's say they don't have enough to, to get a property manager. Um, would you recommend them moving or would you recommend them just finding another deal to cover the property management? You have to find a deal that's going to cover the property manager and all the expenses and still have cash left at the end of the day. Okay. So it's not even an option to be doing things yourself. It, you should be outsourcing from day one. Yeah. That's right. Absolutely. Uh, this is, and the other reason why it's important is that, I mean, you, first of all, you probably still have a full-time job, so mm -hmm. you don't want to be distracted from that. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, the other thing too is that it's going to open a lot more opportunities for you in terms of where you can invest. What's important and what I say often is that you want to live where you, where you want to, but you want to invest where it makes sense, mm. right? So you disconnect living from investing. Right. Uh, uh, yeah, a lot of people think they have to go hand in hand. I know. That's because people want to be like, they want to touch their thing. They yeah, want to the see their thing. Yeah, the tangibility of it. Like yeah. yeah. And, Interesting. Yeah. And it's not necessary. You can go and visit every once in a while. That's fine. Yeah. But uh, to make sure that there is actually a house and stuff <laughs> like that and a tenant. But in the end, it is, this is an investment. Mm. When you invest in the stock market, and you, you don't invest, need to go touch the you, Google building. You, exactly. You don't go and, oh, yeah, this is where Google is and this is yeah, where Facebook I, I've is. I've never touched Google. That's I right. just have seen it. Yeah. So, so on the internet. So it's, it's irrelevant, right? You're investing ah. in something. And in so fact, it just feels a little bit more emotional for people then. And it's kind of like taking, taking a step back and not getting in the weeds of it. Exactly. So it's okay. For, yeah. Exactly. Okay, that makes sense. And now when it and comes... you can scale up too, right? So if you decide that I want to be managing my properties, how properties can how many properties can you manage personally? Well, I mean, at that point, right? you're making a second job for yourself. Well, exactly. Yeah. And, and at what point are you going to transition to your new job as property manager? I see. And is that the job you want? <laughs> so, I, I know not, for sure. I'm not good at fixing things either. <laughs> so this is something that I learned with that eight unit apartment building. When you were doing I it yourself. I do not want to be the janitor, the, apart, the, the property manager, or yeah. the maintenance person. You want to be the investor. Yeah. I want to be the investor. Okay. And so now, when it comes to the financing aspect of it, you know, people my age, we're not making that much right now. We're at the beginning stages of our careers, if that. You know, internships or still have a lot of student debt. If we're talking about houses in like the 200,000 price range, where does that put us in terms of like a down payment that we have to save up for and like how long how long do you think it could take for us to get there? So $200,000 is the top top end, right? So top you, end. Yeah, okay. you can definitely find houses around the 120, 150 thousand mm. uh, dollars. Uh, you would have to put 20% down and you probably should consider having like 5 to 6,000 dollars in closing costs. Okay. including you know paying the fees for the mortgage company and all that kind of stuff and would you recommend getting a house that maybe needs fixing or should we aim for something that's like ready to go turnkey so the only downside with turnkey rental is that you have to put the, the money down for the property and then this is it like it's, it's a great thing you have positive cash flow cash flow from day one this is good uh, but if you want to do the next one you just have to, you have to purchase it 30 
you know, put another thirty thousand dollars down and then get another yeah. property. Yeah. So, um, so. so you're basically saying like it, you're paying for someone else's effort for them having renovated it, exactly. right? So you're not reaping that benefit. You're it's you're paying for it. Yes, exactly. Okay. So the other solution is to basically buy the distressed property yourself, renovate it, rent it out, and then decide if you want to if it's better for you to sell it to get some profit, build some capital so that you can do it again or buy a turnkey rental. Or the other option is to refinance it at the end. So, I see. Okay, so if we want to speed up our process and our journey in real estate, turnkeys are the safe, easiest, mm -hmm. but you're not gonna make as high as a, of a return. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be slower. Whereas you could also do it yourself, do the fix and flipping yourself, um, replenish your capital so you can start that snowball effect quicker. Exactly. Okay, now how difficult would it be to do that? Well, this is where the problem <laughs> The problem start to uh, <laughs> it's more difficult. There's it is. no there's okay. no doubt about it. So yeah. you can imagine that where are you gonna find these properties first of all? So which right. market are you gonna go into? Uh, so you know that what I've done I had I analyzed all the the metropolitan areas in the United States right. and captured all kinds of data and stuff like that and decide that you know the Midwest is one of the best areas to to do that kind mm. of stuff. Um, then, so, okay, so I just told you where the market is. Now you have to find the city, the neighborhood, and... The zip code, the team. Exactly. And now, you. yeah, exa and now you have to find the team. Like, who am right, I going to yeah. work with in Cleveland? Who am I going to work with in Detroit? Right, finding contractors out of A state realtor. or far away. Like, exactly. how do you... So, yeah, yeah, so you have to be on the phone calling call. people, calling hundreds <laughs> you know? of people. Okay, so this is where you were saying, if you don't, if you're not spending your money, you're spending your time. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So yeah, and it's totally feasible. Obviously, we've mm -hmm. we've done that, uh, and uh, but you know it paid off. Uh, but it was but a it lot. Took time it was for a you lot guys, of work. Right? Yeah. 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 And yeah. Uh, so so that and then you have to test them. So you want to start with one property, mm. make sure everything kind of like lines up and all that. The first property we we bought that I bought was in Memphis, and uh, it turned out it was like a, you know. A golden goose, I would say, uh, a unicorn. Uh, bought the property for forty. We actually put like forty thousand. Forty thousand dollars. Yeah. Uh, Wait, was that the down payment? No, that was the whole house. You bought a whole house yeah. for forty thousand. I know. Do you have the same the same expression Californians <laughs> have when I tell them I bought a house? Like, what did you get the door frame? <laughs> or what? <laughs> so um, I put like about like five. Five, maybe six thousand dollars in renovation in it, so it was not so bad. Okay. Uh, and then, so as total, like with all the utilities, I was like about fifty-six, sixty thousand dollars in. Okay. It appraised for like seventy thousand dollars, seventy-five thousand oh, wow. dollars. And this is the this is the interesting piece of it is that when you do these kinds of when you, you buy the distressed property, renovate it, and all that kind of stuff, and you're looking for refinancing. Uh, there are going to be some situation where you can own that property and get most of your original investment out and then the house is still cash flowing. So even at its maximum amount of debt, it was still cash flowing? Exactly. Which allowed you to then take that money and do exactly. another? So with this particular property, uh, I was able to get all my money out. All of it. And plus, it was still cash flowing. And I had seven thousand dollars more in my pocket after refinancing, and it was still cash flowing two hundred over two hundred dollars a month. That's incredible. So I did the deal. I had like more money after the deal. You have more money. You're being paid every month. And I have an asset that's appreciating. That is in, and you get the tax benefit. Yeah. So infinite returns. Uh, for so that, that's for that how period. you sped up your snowball. Well, it doesn't happen for every property, obviously. So it just happened that the first property that I did but ended I mean, up like that's this. such a great example of like what you can do if you find the right deal. Exactly. And it's totally possible. It doesn't happen for every property, as I said. Or maybe not to that extent, but exactly. you can find still something that's of value that way. But you can find, yeah, you can find a property that after refinancing, you can leave maybe five or ten thousand dollars in. Still have it cash flowing, but still then have it cash go flowing. do another deal. And you get most of your money out, except you left like ten thousand dollars in the property at the end. I see. And now, we hear so much about FHA loans on the internet and in terms of like, you could put 2% down or whatever it is. 
Um, what, what's your take on FHA loans and going that route about house hacking and all this extra stuff? Well, a lot of them, so, I mean, it's, it's not a bad way to, to go about it. Uh, so the FHA loan, first of all, the 2% down payment and stuff like that, and uh, I don't know all the details about that, but I believe you have to be being live in that property. You can't mm -hmm. go and buy a rental property. Yeah, it has to be your primary down. residence. It has yeah. to be your primary residence. So you have to move in there. So that if you want to do that, buy a house at that price, that's good. But then you're going to have, you know, you're going to have 98% mortgage on that property. So I hope the payment makes sense, um, you know, and that, right. It, right. Well, that comes full circle back to you being fully leveraged, but knowing you had the cash exactly. to, to sustain exactly. it. Exactly. Okay. So yeah. as long as the numbers are making sense, um, and then behind But me, now you're the one putting the cash now. So now this is a negative cash on your side, right? So because you have to buy it, you have to pay the mortgage. I'd much mm -hmm. rather have a tenant pay the mortgage for me than me having to pay the mortgage. So that's where I guess you could use the workaround of, of house hacking. So yes. like living in a portion, but then have renting out other rooms or yeah. div, you know, getting a duplex or something. That's right. And we've done that. We've done that as well. We didn't you have, have? Yeah, yeah. We've done oh. that in, in Toronto. Uh, you, Lynn and I, yeah. Oh, wow. Well, they didn't have a fancy term like house hacking in those days. Oh, it wasn't glamorous they, back they then. They call that renting your basement. That's what they called it. <laughs> Um, so we had so we, we had identified a house in Toronto, uh, Lynn and I, and then uh, the the basement was not finished. And then when we talked to the seller, the seller was a contractor, and we said, well, we're going to buy the property as long as you can finish the basement for it to make it turn it into an apartment. Oh wow! So so that's what he did for us, and we, we bought the property. He charged us a little bit more money, but he, he finished the basement, and then we we're able to rent it, and that was able to. Uh, help us with the mortgage. That's amazing. Okay. Especially that the mortgage, the interest rate on the mortgage when we bought that house was like 15%. Oh my God. Yeah. And people are freaking out about seven. Exactly. We're still alive. <laughs> See, we still, we didn't, yeah. you know, everything was good. We had the... Wow. Yeah. I, I, okay. And now, now looking at interest rates and see, like you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, we're getting into a more normalized market yes. where, you know, um, Hopefully house prices, well, the house prices were coming down and interest rates were going up and now we're kind of like settling. Mm -hmm. um, do you think now is a good time for a first time investor to get into the market or I, should we be waiting for a better opportunity? I think there's always, if it's a good deal, like the, the tenant is going to pay for the mortgage. So to me, as long as it's cash flowing, it's going to appreciate and is going to pay for itself. I think this is a good investment. Okay, you know, so it's about the investment being good, not the market being good. That's right. You just run, look at all the numbers. I mean, I don't care what the interest rate is, as long as you know the numbers make sense. You know, I, I buy it. That's an interesting way of looking at it, and it kind of gives you less anxiety as a first-time investor, feeling like you're racing against the clock. Mm -hmm. You know, oh, the market's going to change, or I'm going to lose out on this opportunity, and more just focusing on finding the right deal. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Single family uh, is, is in very high demand. I think we're like 4 million single family homes short in the United States. They're not building enough houses in the United States to cover the demand. We have wow. millennials that uh, are supposed to go like in what we call family formation. I know you love these technical terms, but basically millennials that, you know, they're ready to start a family. They're mm. ready to move out of their parents' basement and or their apartment and go with their partners and start a family in a single family home. That's where they want to live. They want to have the dog running around. They want to have the kids running around. Run around. They have a <laughs> swing set and all that in the backyard, right. right? So they're looking for single family rental because that's what mm. they grew up in when they were kids and they want the same for their children. Yeah. So it's going to be, the demand is, is going to be very high for single family homes oh, in the see. future. That's okay. that's my uh, yeah because we're having a new generation yes, looking right, to exactly. expand and move out of apartments, go into a single family house. And millennials is the biggest cohort, the biggest group of people right now in uh, in the United States. More than boomers. More than boomers. Yeah. Oh my God, yeah. Yeah. that is a huge opportunity waiting to yeah, happen. Yeah, yeah, and if we learn anything from boomers, is follow where they're going to spend the money and yes. invest before they do. <laughs> <laughs> invest before they do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Is there any other piece of advice you would give to millennials slash zillennials who are heading into their adulthood? I would say don't waste your money. 
So just be focused on, you know, I, at the beginning, I, I mean, I, I look back and, and I had lots of money that I was making and I didn't know, it was the first time really where I can, oh, I can, I have can all this money, this? I don't know what, yeah. to, what to do. And uh, so I would just spend money on things that I didn't need. So mm. uh, don't do that. Save your money, save money until you can invest that money and investing is, is the best way. That's going to start kind of like the snowball roll, the snowball effect. Uh, you're going to have, you're going to invest in your first single family rentals. You're going to have tax advantages. You're going to pay less in taxes. You're going to get positive cash flow, and then that's going to increase. And then you're going to continue to save mm. that. And then the next year, you're going to be able to buy another one. And then next year, another one. And then after that, you're going to be able to buy two per year and three per year. And, all and then that. that's how the snowball. Yeah. So it's more just like having the patience in the beginning when the yes. snowball's really, really tiny to yes. get it to start to cycle. Exactly. I think that's probably where a lot of people struggle is that beginning stage and not losing hope. Because when you're making $200 a month in cash exactly. flow, it feels stupid. You yes. feel silly and you feel like I just put my entire life savings for $200 a month. Exactly. But it's the waiting game. Exactly, exactly. Because the two hundred dollars a month in cash flow. I mean, we had that all the time. We're talking to people in California, uh, investors, and say, "Well, two hundred dollars a month. I mean, I make that. I make that uh, this morning. Like, yeah. Or I made that in an hour, in two hours of work. I yeah. mean, why would I do that? Like, waste a month to do that. So that's one aspect of it. This is just the cash flow. Mm -hmm. Cash flow is not everything. It's also, there's also tax advantages that mm -hmm. you get from that with depreciation and all your expenses and all that kind of stuff. The, also, the other, uh, other aspect of it is appreciation. So this asset is appreciating. Mm. So you're making money in three different ways from one purchase. Exactly. And it may not seem significant when you look at each one individually, but collectively, it's going to make a big difference. Exactly. I see. People, people think very short term. Yeah. You know, well, I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, you could use that exact same amount of money and put it into a high interest savings account and feel like you're making more yeah. it, just from the cash flow. Yeah. But that's not going to appreciate. That's not going to give you tax advantages. You'll get taxed on the interest. You're going to get taxed <laughs> on the interest. So really, it's only half. Yeah. Um, that makes a lot of sense. Well, I appreciate you sharing your story. That was really, really motivational for me to be able to hear. And I'm sure a lot of other people will feel like they actually can take action because you were able to with absolutely nothing at at such a young age. Mm -hmm. So where can people go if they want to maybe have you as their mentor or learn more from you about real estate? So if people want to learn more about me and then kind of like the best way to invest in real estate, I think they should go to FlipSystem, FlipSystem.com. Um, I think this is where they're going to learn the most about real estate investing mm -hmm. and uh, how to basically ramp up their real estate investing business. What does FlipSystem do? So FlipSystem is helps a real estate investor in, teach them how to invest in real estate. Um, so from people that are new to, they haven't done anything in real estate, to people that want to scale up their real estate investing business. Uh, so we, there's online training, there's coaching, uh, we connect them with the acquisitions team, we connect them with the team on the ground. So if you have never invested out of state and you don't have a team in Cleveland or Detroit and stuff like that, we're right, going to connect right. you with a team on the ground that we have vetted that we have, uh, you know, we've talked to them, we've maybe even invested with them. Um, and then we're also connecting you with uh, the community, other real estate investors mm. that are in the same shoes, the same situation that you're in and uh, share experiences. We have daily coaching calls. Daily with, coaching. With experienced real estate investor and our coaches, obviously. Yeah. It's where you can ask any questions you want about real estate. And yeah. we have a lot of experience. We have a lot of experienced coaches and they can help you do that. And finally, if you want to sell the property at the end um, of the renovations, you can also list it on Martel Turnkey. Okay, amazing. So, I mean, you mentioned how important mentorship was for you. So I'm sure a lot of people are going to be wanting to find the right person to be able to help them or be surrounded by like-minded individuals. And if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you on socials? So the best way to reach me on, so on any social platform is Eric Martel Official. So this is the... Uh, Your handle everywhere? My handle everywhere. Okay. Much. Except X for some reason. I can't change that. Oh, I was like, what's X? Twitter. Yeah, oh. <laughs> If you are interested to learn more about real estate investing, I suggest that you visit the flipsystem.com website uh, where there, there's a program and a system for you to help you build uh, your real estate investment business and portfolio. 
Uh, if you want to reach out to me on social media, you can find me at Eric Martel Official on all social media. My only goal is to help you make more money. If that's what you want, subscribe for more videos.